welcome to another week in session today. We're so glad to have you here, Mr. Riz Ahmed, and we'll be discussing a lot of topics today. Hello, Mr. Riz. Uh, thank you so much for um, coming down to Westford to have a week in session with us. It was very inspiring to hear your views on education and finding your purpose. Um, I want to talk about the education one. I have a question. Um, in your Wall Street Journal interview, you mentioned that globalization is shrinking the world and widening the markets in which business operate. How do you think that this, the impact of globalization, is playing out in the education field? Sure, that's a great question. Um, first and foremost, thanks for having me here. Um, I really enjoyed the session earlier and love to sit down with you and, and have this kind of chat. The interesting thing is if you asked a few years ago about globalization, a lot of people were talking about the same thing. They were talking about markets colliding, opening up, uh, lots of economic policies were there around um, opening markets to free trade, the movement of people, that's the whole basis of the EU really, free movement of people and goods. And then we saw a number of things, Brexit, we saw Donald Trump, so the, like, the, the Trump-like people that were being elected around the world, and we saw a return to more nationalistic sentiments. And so now what people are talking about is deglobalization, this thing where markets are actually shrinking and becoming more internally focused. And how that relates to education is before when people were saying, oh, well, we can access education globally, and when we get an education, we can move globally, people are having to look more internally. Now, when we look internally, and now with the pandemic that's happened, where effectively countries were shut off from each other, and you saw people and officials taking decisions I'll give an example, Uganda, which went through the longest school shutdown in the world, almost two years of no schooling. No other country followed this precedent, but countries were making individual decisions about their people, and this directly impacted the generation that was going through schools. So the issue in general <coughs> in education is around three key pillars. Access, do you have access to a school, to good, in good education? Second is quality. Like, is it an appropriate level of quality that you are receiving from when you go to this um, in education institution? And the third is affordability. Can you actually afford it? And what's been happening is governments have been failing in these three things. And therefore, you find huge numbers of people, and huge numbers of children that have no access to education. The quality of education is extremely poor. And then they, even if it's semi-decent, they can't afford it. And that's what I'm working on. I'm working on actually trying to bridge these three things from my initiative, Equal Ed, which is going to be bringing volunteer teachers through online medium, through video conferencing, into, directly into classrooms in schools in Uganda, India, Pakistan, Kenya, around the world, Chile, etc. And these, what I'm calling volunteer teachers, volunteer teachers, will be teaching from anywhere in the world these students on, a, on the other side of the world. And what, what this does in a very small way, it creates a cultural exchange. So as the world basically starts closing up, this initiative is going to start bringing the world more open together. So someone who's, for example, me sitting in Dubai, um, wanting to teach mathematics, and I'm connecting with a group of students in Chile or Uganda, now I'm seeing a whole culture that I never experienced before. And at the same time, they're seeing a culture on the other side that they're never experiencing before. So I think this is really important in trying to bring the world back together. While governments are making decisions and policies and the world is talking about deglobalization, can we at a grassroots level create more connections to offset this, this imbalance that's being created right now? Yeah, my following question will also go with it is how essential is it to deliver education to countries with a really unstable economy? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, a great question. If you look at a data, pure data, which is gross enrollment rates of students in a country and the economic prosperity or GDP, you'll see there's a direct correlation. And actually the biggest jump first will be around this point around access. Can they access education? And then it goes on to quality and affordability. So there's, there's a direct correlation that's there. And there's, when you look past the correlation, you'll see causation. And it's a circular causation. You educate the population. The population become more educated, become more productive, come with new innovations, new ideas, take um, better paying jobs. They, this stimulates the economy. As the economy improves, then people spend more money on education and it's circular. But this is something that's missing 
from a lot of government policies. And the problem is, the stem of the problem is, when governments come into power in any election that you see, and I'm not anti-government by, by any means, but what happens is when governments come in power and they make promises, they make promises on education and healthcare and X, Y, and Z, everyone likes to hear the thing about education. Super important. Everyone knows it's so important. Our children's education, etc. But once they get into power, the impact of the things you do now on education happen well after they're probably going to be out of office, right? So they don't focus on it because the impact's way off. They're going to focus on things, quick wins, that they can say, we did this right now, right? I mean, Boris Johnson, who's just left um, 10 Downing Street in the UK, he focuses on, oh, I did well in, with the war in Ukraine yeah. and Brexit. Where are the policies around healthcare and education? education? So the problem is governments are not focusing on these things. If they did focus on these things, they would see that this causation between economics and, and education is uber important. And I think that what goes with that, and this is a cultural thing, is to have better quality teachers, it's the issue I'm trying to solve, to have better quality teachers, the status of teachers needs to improve. Teachers need to be more respected and better paid. And again, if you look at the data, the countries that respect teachers more as a profession do better academically and the education systems are better. For example, South, South Korea. For example, in other countries, which I've, I've been to myself, where the respect of the teachers very small, you know, like, oh, you're a teacher? Mm, why? Why are you a teacher? The quality of people that you're going to get going into those professions, teaching, et cetera, academia, is lower because of that status thing. So we, need, we as what we can do, is raise the, the respect and status of teachers. And what governments need to do is realize that these, we need longer-term plans in place because it directly links to economic prosperity. Actually, while addressing um, Ali's question, you managed to answer my question on what are the deficiencies in the education sector? You mentioned three access, affordability, and quality. Uh, would you, I mean, you already spoke a bit about this, but would you like to speak more on yep. how addressing them would change how education is delivered? No, that's really important because I think one thing that COVID did was create a huge inequality in education because effectively everyone had to stay at home and those who had access to the latest technology and schools and institutions that could deliver quality education online, they benefited. They did okay. Their education continued. While others literally missed out completely. They didn't even have the basics, that the internet connection that they could receive online learning. So that's the bad bit. Now what the good bit is that's come out of this is everyone's realized how important internet connect connectivity is, video conferencing, Technology companies are now moving from just creating hardware and software to actually moving into, like, let's create technology specific for education. And I think what this is solving is now the infrastructure in people's homes and institutions is being built up, for example, internet connections and interactive boards and these kind of things, laptops, et cetera. Everyone's really realizing how important these are. And there's a whole body of work actually to recognize internet connectivity as a hu basic human right. It's your human right to have internet because that's how important it is. Now, and specifically in education, this means that we can deliver education from anywhere in the world. A teacher in one country can teach students in another country a lot easier than they could do before. So I think what's, ha what's happening now, and literally in the last two years, is this is exponentially growing, this access, the, therefore the quality, and therefore the affordability, because now imagine one teacher can teach multiple different classrooms and multiple different geographies at the same time because it's being video conferenced in. At the same time, a lot of content is being delivered, uh, created that those students can then take away and work on, multiple students. So you have these economies of scale now and economies of scope also. So I think we're, we're in a good place to take advantage of the situation. And I think governments and people uh, with influence need to focus more on, okay, how do we use technology and the power of what I'm trying to do with volunteers to bridge the gap. Because again, unless we bridge the gap, we're going to have the haves and the have nots. And for global equality, that's a really bad and dangerous thing. Yeah, talking about COVID and technology, what, how, what do you think about learning in the post pandemic world? And where do you see it going in the future? Yeah, so when the pandemic first hit, actually thinking pre prior to the pandemic was, 
we're going to end up in a situation where you're sitting at home and you're being educated at home through you know, a headset or something along those lines. Then the pandemic hit and that became a reality. And what people realized is, and again, the data shows this very clearly, about how learners learn, how they learn from social and physical engagement, as well as basic content. That social and physical side of things is, is extremely important to their development. And therefore, what we're seeing, if you look at the latest parent surveys, is parents want to still send their children to school for them to get that engagement, social and physical. But they also now have access to other technologies. So you might get a situation where children, a child goes to school, has their classes, goes home, accesses the dashboard, and does their homework and assessments on that dashboard. Then those assessments are no longer marked by the teacher in pen and paper. They're automatically marked on whatever software or dashboard you're using. That then, using AI and machine learning, picks out where that student actually misunderstood or didn't understand a certain concept. As an example, if you sat in a, uh, a um, mathematics assessment on decimals and fractions, et cetera, and a teacher marked it, you got 70%. That's the level of feedback you're getting. 70% and you got 30% wrong. What the latest uh, AI and machine learning software can do is you do the assessment and it says, you know what, you really don't understand fractions and specifically fractions where you, the denominator is larger than the numerator. Mm -hmm. And it can pick these things out and then give you content for you to help improve that fundamental building block. And then you can vastly improve uh, the, the quality of education that you receive. So I think there's going to be a blend of offline and online, where online supplements offline, so bricks and mortar education. But this notion that we're all going to move to virtual learning full time, 100% of our education, I think that is a myth that's been dispelled now through COVID. But I think it's a really good thing because, like I said again, a lot of people are investing now billions in education technology pre pandemic. There was roughly about $200 billion spent globally by governments and institutions, etc. In the next five years, it's going to be more than 400 billion. So you're seeing the sheer investment into ed tech that's happening now. And I'm really excited about that. I'm excited for that too. Yeah. It sounds like education um, will really be enhanced and will, will really be improving in the future decades. I hope so. Um, yeah. I have, now turning to you, um, Mr. Riz, you have achieved CFO and have been in the title of CEO by the age of 27. That's, that's impressive. And um, other, other than qualities like passion and uh, professionalism, what other qualities, in your opinion, do you think contribute to someone's success? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your kind words. Um, and you know, following on from that, I managed to, and again, it was because of opportunities that were presented to me, take on a really diverse set of roles. I sat on a number of boards. I became CEO of a number of entities in Africa and in India. Um, also, our support services businesses here, where we had buses, uniforms, catering, etc. So I got a real diverse set of um, roles and opportunities. And I think the crux of it is, and I get asked this question a lot, the crux of it is the following. You first realize that you are most likely not the smartest person in the room. You're most likely not the most talented person in the room. If you're doing a sport, for example, it's unlikely you're going to be the strongest or the fastest person there. But the one thing that is completely in your control is how hard you are willing to work. So if you come with a mindset that no one's going to outwork me, no one is going to outwill me, no one's going to outdetermine me, if that person turns up at 8 a.m., I'm going to turn up at 6 a.m. If that person finishes work or finishes training or finishes their studies at 6 p.m., I'm going to finish at 8 p.m. I'm categorically going to work harder and smarter than everyone else. And I think it can be summed up in the following. To be successful and to succeed, you do not need to be phenomenally skilled. Just recognize that. You do not need to, and you cannot have pity, I don't have this skill, I don't have this skill, etc. But what you do need to be is phenomenally willed. This is the most important thing. A lot has been written and a lot of things around willpower. But it's something that is, you can develop in yourself. And when you reach that point where you're tired, it's like when you 
do a sport, I don't know if you guys do any sports, when you read a, do a sport, or I know you're a musician, when you're doing something and you feel a bit tired, when you study the people that are the most successful, they go beyond that. Muhammad Ali actually said, I start counting my sit-ups. When I start feeling pain. Exactly, when I start feeling pain. Not, I can't start counting my sit-ups before I even got onto the mat. But he feels the pain in his abs, then he starts counting. That is the level beyond where you can, you can reach. And it's a mindset and a willpower thing. So I think, again, that's, that's the crux of it. To succeed, you do not need to be phenomenally skilled, but you do need to be phenomenally willed. Yeah, talking about yourself, how do you make time for continuous learning while also leading? I think um, what, this, again, a lot's been said and written about work-life balance, okay? And I agree with work-life balance. But I, what I try to do is I say, look, these are all the things I want to do. And I spread them. I say, I want to do these over my lifetime. I don't know how long my life's going to be, but let's say I want to do these things over the next 10, 20 years. And then I will focus on one or two things really specifically. So right now, I'm, I need to work, and I need to do X, and I'm just going to dedicate all my time to that. So I'm not going to have time for learning and doing these other things. At the point I am now in my life, I actually spend every day learning. I'm working on equal ed. I'm studying. Um, I just finished my studies at Harvard Business School. I'm studying at Oxford University, doing my MBA. Um, so you make time for these things. But you don't necessarily need to say, okay, today did I have a good work-life balance? Tomorrow did I, am I going to have a good work-life balance this month, this year? But over a period of time, you need to balance these things. And I think learning... So I, I don't like to talk about children, education. I like to talk about learners specifically because genuinely everyone can be a learner. You're continuously learning and you give up when you stop learning. So keep learning throughout your life. It doesn't matter if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. I think the average age of, I think your MBA class here is about 50. Shows us inspiring. Keep learning, keep developing yourself. And then the most important thing is share those learnings. So that's the reason I'm here. You know, I've got some learnings. I've got a lot to, still to learn. But when you have something that you know, try and share it with the younger generation so they can learn and they can develop those things. And then ask them to go and share it with the, their younger generation. So if you have siblings, go and share those things with your siblings. When you get older, share them with your teams. Um, when you go beyond that, come and give a lecture and share it with other people. And don't be, af don't be afraid of this stuff, you know? Don't be afraid of speaking and even saying the wrong thing. It's you practice and practice makes perfect. Thank you, that's a wonderful answer. I think we are done with the question. Thank you so much, Mr. Ahmed. Uh, until next time. Great Thank you so much. Thank you.